these people are are burning incense before a false god or a demon. And so you tell them that's evil. Yes, burning incense to demons is evil. So we should not do that. But is that what was happening in that action? So, Father Cristino, you and yourself, Your Grace, you were both at the CCCB plenary, I believe. That's how you uh, how you say it recently. You were both plenary, attending yep. plenary. Okay, um, Father Cristino, uh, your presence. You were you were at the this meeting of bishops. What was your role in that uh, in that conference? Well, I was invited by my own bishop, Bishop McGratton in Calgary, who uh, was going to be assuming the presidency of the conference of bishops during the course of that week. Uh, to be present and uh, participate in one small portion of the meetings, which had to do with uh, just delivering some thoughts and reflections on uh, where we are at with seminary formation. Uh, because among my hats that I wear in my ministry, I'm also the vocation director of our diocese. And so at the end of the plenary, we put on a conference for vocation directors and their bishops uh, from across the country for those who were able to make it. So it was primarily for me to be there at the end of the plenary to take part in that, that I was invited to be present. Now, you were t today we're talking about liturgy and uh, the, the relationship with the Mass and liturgy with culture, specifically in the context of Indigenous reconciliation and, um, yeah, the relationship between Indigenous culture and, and liturgy. I have a, a question for both of you, and maybe your grace beginning with you. Uh, in this conversation about the relationship of culture and ethnicity with liturgy and how the mass unfolds, uh, you know, we have different communities within every diocese or archdiocese. Maybe you have a, a church that's predominantly Portuguese or a church that's predominantly Filipino, or in many cases, I mean, in the archdiocese of Edmonton, we have an indigenous Catholic church, Sacred Heart Church. And so you have this, this community of culture and often ethnicity that comes to worship together. So when we look at the the Roman Rite, the, the Roman Catholic Mass, and how much are, are we meant to see culture in general reflected in the Mass? You know, if you go to a Portuguese Mass, aside from the language that the Mass is being celebrated in, should it really be obvious that this is a Portuguese Mass, or this is an Indigenous Mass, or this is a Filipino Mass? Um, yeah, in general, with the Roman Rite, how much is culture supposed to seep into the the actions, the, the rubrics of the mass. Well, I, I think it's a huge it's a huge consideration because in the first instance, the gospel is communicated to culture, right? and we want the gospel to be inculturated, which means that the, the the truth of Christ, which is ever the same, never changes, uh, meets people where they are in their culture and can transform that from within. Our encounter with the gospel, our primary encounter with the gospel, is in fact in the liturgy, especially the, the, the Mass, where Christ renders himself truly substantially present in that moment. Uh, so it's, it's important that people in that encounter feel at home, feel that the Lord is coming to encounter them where they are. And that's why it's, it's absolutely appropriate that the faith that is always one and the same, that is celebrated and communicated in the liturgy is given a cultural expression such that people feel the connection, feel that they are ha actually having Christ and his gospel communicated to them. There are clearly um, elements of the liturgy that do not change that are always the same, but there are ways in which that can be surrounded by cultural expression, whether that is through the language, as you say. Often it's also by music. Often it can be through the uh, the liturgical art that's that's in the church building, whether that's statues or whatever that can actually help people call to mind that particular devotional history, that devotional custom that that they're that they're accustomed to. Father Cristino, uh, how would you elaborate on that relationship between a, a given demographic and culture, and and how the mass literally looks and and feels to somebody who's going to enter that particular church? I would build off of uh, what His Grace has, has already said in that uh, we need to communicate the gospel to a culture, to, to a people who have to be communicated with in a manner that will make sense to them, uh, that we, you can't show up to some place and expect them to receive what you have to offer if you're not able to convey it to them in a way that will be relatable. Uh, that's why the early missionaries, wherever we hear about there having been missionary exploits to some place in the world, they didn't sit around waiting for the indigenous populations to learn 
uh, French or Spanish or Latin, they undertook to learn their language uh, in order for them to communicate with them on uh, in their terms. And so that is a, an evangelical principle. The liturgy itself, while obviously having an evangelical component, the proclamation of the gospel is, is, is at the heart of the liturgy. I'm also careful to observe the distinction between uh, the liturgy as the principal means by which evangelization occurs from the initial proclamation of, of the gospel, the, the kerygma, as, as we talk about throughout the preaching of, of the gospel and acts of the apostles, that we don't have to rely upon the liturgy uh, specifically the celebration of the Eucharist as the only way by which we are going to effectively convey the gospel. There needs to be a preliminary uh, work that is done. You'll notice between culture, another root word that shares that with uh, in common is, is cultivation. Uh, and so there is a cultivation that needs to be done and undertaken with any group of people who are going to participate in the church's rituals eventually that has prepared the way for them to receive uh, the gospel because it transcends our cultures. Uh, that's the gift uh, of, of our Catholic faith is that there is nowhere that it does not belong. There is nowhere that it cannot be communicated to the people who are receiving it. And so while it will certainly impact eventually in, in some way or another, the liturgical expression of the people in that place, it also is meant to be able to transcend it and, and it invite them into the more universal uh, reception of the gospel that we have received from the Lord and that we continue to receive through the mediation of his church. So we have, uh, we're all members of the, the Roman Catholic Church, and that's the, that's the liturgy that we, we attend and that you as priests celebrate um, for the most part. There's that word Roman in front of our, our Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church is in some sort of way um, Latin or, I don't mean the language Latin, I mean literally going back in history to the, the Latin Roman culture, uh, is that supposed to be reflected in our liturgy? Is there, like, what's the significance of that word Roman when we think of the mass that we, we all know and, and participate in? I think it would uh, fundamentally capture the fact that we are, wherever we find ourselves, celebrating the, the liturgy in communion with Rome and with the Roman okay. pontiff, right? Okay. So it's 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 the it's the central liturgy of the church centered in Rome around the Roman Pontiff, which obviously is going to find different cultural expressions as it's celebrated around the world. Father Cristino, what are your thoughts on this? Would you say that the Mass is meant is it meant to be the uh, cultural in that sense? Like, is it meant to reflect the culture of the people that are in the pews, or is it, in a sense, supposed to like you like you were saying earlier, reflect this kind of transcendent where it's kind of above or, or beyond? human culture? I, I, that's maybe a tricky question, but mm -hmm. yeah. I think I know what you're asking. Uh, because it's meant to be transcendent, uh, it is meant to facilitate our communion with God, who is outside of space and time, certainly yeah. outside of our, our human cultural experience. Uh, there is an element of the liturgy that should be pulling us up <laughs> into that and that we would experience and receive it as, as that uh, some kind of a magnetic pull, almost as it were. Uh, but we are not disembodied spirits who uh, just uh, spiritually connect to some manifestation of worship. We are, we are bound by our culture. We are bound by the things that form us. When you leave behind whatever you've walked away from to enter the church, you will be returning to it. Uh, and so we can't live a compartmentalized life where we, we switch off that part of who we are for this period of time in order to enter into worship and then resume that afterwards. So there is obviously meant to be uh, some kinds of cultural embodiment where there is discernment needed is the way in which we allow culture to penetrate the liturgy without imposing upon the liturgy. Uh, because it's also possible for us to end up losing sight of what the liturgy is meant to convey because we are preoccupied with making it uh, be encountered in a particular way as opposed to allowing us to encounter the liturgy and so be brought up into what we are meant to experience. And so from that angle, I would say culture 
is a component, but it, it can't be the, the be all and end all of the way in which someone enters into the liturgy. I would add to that too. I think um, understanding that we want to bring ourselves as we are, as people from a particular culture and find ourselves at home there and so on. That needs, to, that needs to be governed by a certain humility, it seems to me, in the sense that recognizing that the liturgy of the church, given that Christ is himself truly substantially present in it, will transform our culture. Culture has at its root that word cult, worship. Right? So really, if we understand culture properly, at its very heart is the worship of God, just as at the very heart of our understanding of anthropology is the worship of God. That is what uh, shapes us, transforms us, because it is an encounter with the living God in that moment. So yes, there will be cultural expressions that find their place in the liturgy. Um, but but as, as that unfolds, we need to be open to have our culture as is transformed, informed um, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, encountered in the word made flesh in the mass. Father Christina, you were the liturgical coordinator for the papal visit. Uh, last summer, Pope Francis came to Canada and the Archdiocese of Edmonton. Uh, Your Grace, you were the general coordinator mm -hmm. for that, that overall endeavor. So you were collaborators in that, in that big initiative. And I, I wonder, Father Christina, when it came to liturgy and the close relationship with Indigenous culture that was being celebrated and honored throughout that entire visit of Pope Francis, uh, what was a good example of, of uh, a marriage between culture, uh, particularly indigenous culture and the liturgy that you saw, uh, perhaps that you facilitated during that, that papal visit? One of the things that I think we tried to make sure that we did uh, very explicitly was less about the incorporation of externally visible signs of whatever it might be into the liturgy itself and see wherever possible the incorporation of indigenous people. How, how, how are we making sure that those who are participating in, uh, remember at the, at, the, at the heart of the mass is, is the prayer at the end of the offertory, pray brothers and sisters that my sacrifice and yours, right? The, the, the incorporation of the people who have gathered to worship is an integral component of the liturgy. Uh, and so incorporation of indigenous people and making sure that they were being uh, involved in and, and being provided this opportunity to participate in the rituals themselves was, by, to my mind, the, of the highest priority. Uh, that way there was not merely the sense of being observers uh, at something that was apparently being offered for them, but was actually invitational to invite our indigenous Catholic population into that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it was without the externally visible things. And that's why we made sure to incorporate uh, the elements of something like the music that we heard as uh, the Holy Father was arriving to Sacred Heart Church, uh, the vestments that were worn, why they were designed the way in which they were, uh, what the meaning of the elements themselves that were used to create the ornamentation on them, uh, the different ways in which at outside of the Mass, we had liturgical moments too. You'll recall at Lac St. Anne, uh, I don't know what the general population thought was happening at Lac St. Anne, but as far as the Vatican was concerned, it was a liturgy of the word. And so that that's what I explained it to be to them, and that was fine. And yet it was a, a time where there was a lot more flexibility afforded to allow the Holy Father to actually enter into an active participation in a very long-standing tradition of participating in a pilgrimage to the waters of the lake itself, to be the bishop present that year who blessed the waters of the lake, as a bishop always has done now for many generations, uh, that he began his blessing of the lake by acknowledging prayer in the four directions before he concluded with a blessing over the water, uh, the vestment that he wore there as a, a Métis stole, a Métis sash that had been fashioned deliberately into being a stole. Those are the signs that are externally visible, uh, but which are perfectly harmonious with the manner in which we are gathering to pray and worship anyhow. And so showing that harmony, I think, was at least by my standards or the objective that I was trying to uh, undertake, 
was the, the essence of what we were seeking to accomplish there, was the harmony that it exists between the indigenous cultures that are represented across the country, as well as the liturgical and ritual life of the church. Yeah. I was going to say the Pope himself during his visit also saw how that's playing itself out on a regular basis. In this archdiocese, when he visited Sacred Heart Church of the First Peoples, we've just redone the interior, of course, following the fire that was there. But you have the sanctuary with the, the poles that are reminiscent of, of a teepee, uh, the sanctuary, or sanctuary the, the tabernacle itself shaped as a, a, in the TP form, right? all uh, indigenous expression of the word made flesh and, and dwelt among us. And then when mass is celebrated there, say for example, a uh, collection is taken up not by going around the church with the baskets, but people come forward and they place their donations on a blanket, which is opened up in front of, in front of the altar. And then music will involve drumming and everything else. There's all kinds of ways in which the Mass, while it remains always the Mass, is obviously being celebrated in a way that's culturally significant to those who are participating. And the, and the Pope would have seen that. He didn't celebrate Mass there, but he would have seen it just by walking into that church, too. Father Christina, you've uh, actually addressed this last year. We had you on the podcast, and you talked about smudging. Can you explain what smudging is Um and, and how you see its relationship with the mass. Because I, I know there's been lots of debate, especially in the online sphere of, you know, is it a cultural, traditional expression like, expression like that? Um, does it have a place within the mass? Does it not? Um, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of debate about that particular question because it's such an evidently uh, cultural expression. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I don't even know the full significance of, of, of it myself. So if you could give some context, that'd be great. First of all, we have to always, uh, anytime we approach any of these questions and we talk about something being indigenous, we have to realize that we're always using a gigantic blanket umbrella yeah. term uh, to capture yeah. uh, many diverse groups of people from within that, that one characterization. And so, uh, to call smudging an indigenous ritual uh, ignores the fact that for the many of the Métis, uh, certainly for the Inuit and a variety of, of the different First Nations themselves, this isn't necessarily something that relates to their cultural experience either. It pertains to the cultural expression of many of the First Nations people across the country, but not even all of them. And so we always have to understand that we can't characterize any one ritual element as pertaining to everyone's common experience who falls underneath that umbrella of Indigenous, uh, which already speaks to part of the complication when we get into these uh, conversations and debates around how to have an Indigenous liturgy. Uh, that's like saying, well, how can we have a, a Pan-Asian liturgy? Well, I don't know if the people in Thailand consider themselves all that much the same as the people in China uh, or in Hong Kong. I mean, the, because you're sharing a continent with each other doesn't necessarily mean you have all that much in common. Uh, and so already we're, we're speaking very ambiguously when we start talking about an indigenous expression of the liturgy. Because how will we incorporate so many different people's cultural expressions into this one standardized thing. Uh, smudging being something that we are very familiar with and comfortable with in the West. In my own family growing up, uh, I can remember there was a certain uncle that I had who when we would go fishing, we'd smudge uh, before we fished. Uh, and if we didn't catch anything, you'd say, well, I guess we didn't smudge properly or something. It was, <laughs> it was just sort of like how we lived. It was normal. It was just a part of what we did. Uh, that is not the case for so many others. And so when we understand smudging, we have to see it, first of all, as being where it pertains to the people who are participating in it. For those who do so, it is generally able to be understood as a ritual of purification and a ritual of personal preparation for whatever it is that you are about to do. Uh, it is meant to be symbolic of trying to restore a sense of, of equilibrium within yourself uh, by receiving the gifts of the earth, what we traditionally call medicines, the things that are burned like the sage or the sweet grass, uh, and then allowing that burning thing to be taken in. You, you, you breathe in and you envelop yourself with that smoke so as 
to demonstrate your efforts at trying to restore your personal equilibrium, restore your own need for personal purification with the gift of creation itself. Right? So while it has certainly a, a spiritual reality for those who participate in it, uh, you could hardly say that anyone who is smudging is thinking that they're worshiping in that particular moment, uh, because it's certainly not the case that indigenous people would worship themselves. Uh, that is one of the things uh, among that giant category that indigenous people do share in common is that understanding of a creator who is uh, honored and worshiped and adored in whatever way you would use language to describe that. And so it's not a, 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 an act of worship in itself in the first place. Where I struggle with the appropriation of something like smudging into the liturgy is where I'm afraid we are actually working backwards in a sense where we would say, oh, well, we want to have an enculturated liturgy so Indigenous people feel more comfortable. So we're going to impose our understanding of what's happening at this moment in the Mass onto your ritual so that it can have a justifiable place in it. So, oh, there's a bowl with smoke coming out of it. Okay, well, we'll replace our thurible with that. Well, that's not what the thurible with smoking incense is meant for when you envelop the sanctuary and the altar or the book of the Gospels or the Holy Eucharist with the smoke of rising incense. That, that has a completely different meaning. But smoke's coming up out of it. Oh, okay, well, then I guess they're equivalent to each other. That That's... I actually think that that's a culturally insensitive thing because it's a it's a form of imposition where we are ascribing to this thing what we have decided it must mean if we're going to incorporate it into what we're doing. Uh, or we call it a ritual of purification. Oh, okay, well then we'll replace the penitential act of the mass with the rite of smudging. Again, I, I have to ask, uh, does does any indigenous person who smudge believe that their sins have just been forgiven? I, I don't know that anyone who smudged before they ever received the gospel thought that that's what was happening. Uh, so why would now we say we can replace an act that is meant to remind us of the need for penance and confession of our sin, receiving the mercy of God in order to properly prepare us for right worship? It's again, a kind of imposition upon it of our own understanding and meaning. And so I'm very sensitive to that ex expression being appropriated in a manner that I think maybe only makes sense from one direction and that from the other direction of Indigenous people observing it saying, oh, well, I like smudging. And so I'm happy to see that they're smudging in the mass. I think both sides end up missing where this meaning is coming from. And so well, I've seen that done very beautifully at Sacred Heart Church of the First Peoples. People smudge as they're entering the church. Well, now that makes great sense to me. If it's a way of purifying myself, restoring my equilibrium, preparing myself for something, you know, when, I, when my parents used to bring me to mass, they'd walk in, bless themselves with holy water, genuflect, kneel down and pray and had their hands folded. And that's what we did before mass. Well, if that means less to you than smudging as you prepare yourself to enter into the church and participate in the mass, then of course you should smudge because it's not an act of worship. And it's not inside of the liturgy, but it's accomplishing what we said it's for in the first place. So there's absolutely room for these things, but we need to be mindful of where we are incorporating them and why. Well, I'm just, that, no, that's, that's, that's very, very well said. The only thing that I'm thinking in addition to that is the, the profound respect that the Indigenous peoples have for protocol and for ceremony. And the, that respect expresses itself in accepting the ceremony and the protocol as is and following it. Uh, so um, I, I would be, <laughs> I'd be shocked if an indigenous person uh, looking at our ceremony protocol would say, please change it for me. I can't imagine an indigenous person with such profound respect for, for protocol asking that of, of another group. And by the same token, we should make the effort to understand what they mean in their own ceremonies and protocols and respect those. And part of that respect, uh, mutually uh, practiced, is to make sure that we honor each properly by making sure that they're not in the improper places, if I can, if I can put it that way. 
Now, Father Casino, you grew up with uh, your your Métis yourself. What's the particular your in particular Indigenous heritage? My father had a Métis father yeah. and a Cree mother. Okay. And so I have both Cree and Métis mixed heritage on my father's side. My mother is Italian, the, the daughter of Italian immigrants to Canada. So you grew up in a, in a context where there was smudging. I mean, you, you, you smudged growing up. I've, I've read the comment section of, of, different, uh, of different articles and videos, even the podcast that we did with you previously that, where the topic of smudging came up. And it seems like there is disagreement sometimes about what smudging is, even within different Indigenous communities. I've seen it described in the comments section as pagan, so therefore utterly, uh, you know, contrary to the Catholic faith. And for others, it's something that's inherently holy. It's at least, I mean, the comments section on any YouTube video or any kind of internet posting is going to be uh, a mess either way. But uh do you have any any thoughts on elaborating on that, at least that internet confusion of, is this pagan? Is it not pagan? Is it holy? Is it unholy? Yes. Uh, educate yourself. <laughs> if you're going to comment on anything anywhere, then please have something reasonable to say. And that's why our comment sections are unreasonable, because people just blurt out their opinion, and it has to do with their reaction to what they see. Right. Okay. And I believe that in a, in a manner of the effort at evangelization that we are talking about here in the early evangelization of indigenous peoples across these lands, I suspect less effort was shown than would have been helpful to fully understand the cultural significance of certain actions before they were just condemned. Uh, my heart breaks when I talk to some of the elders that I'm close to in our communities who to this day feel inherently guilty about having any indigenous things, any cultural expressions, because at some point in their life as a child, they were told that that's evil. And sometimes they were told that by their own parents and grandparents, because their parents and grandparents had been told that by the priests or religious who taught them. Now, if you see the smoke coming up out of this pot or this bowl or this skull. And you say to yourself, well, these people are, are burning incense before a false god or a demon. And so you tell them that's evil. Yes, burning incense to demons is evil. So we should not do that. But is that what was happening in that action? And if you didn't seek to know and understand that in advance, and you just condemned it beforehand, that's what produces uh, some of this cultural shame that has uh, been experienced by many in our Indigenous communities, where I think in some instances, what they were doing was not adequately understood or sought to be adequately understood by those who would have sort of generally condemned such practices. Uh, the other criticism that I'm constantly facing from the people who think that I am a bit more on the pagan side than on the Catholic side, which is just already something that kind of blows my mind, but is that <laughs> we shouldn't we, we shouldn't be uh, attached to any of these things. Once you've received the Catholic faith, you've received everything you need. So if it's not in the Catholic faith, you don't need it anymore. You should put it aside. You should be done with it. And what I like to always come back to is the question of patriotism. Patriotism is a virtue. We, we actually, St. Thomas Aquinas describes love of one's country as being virtuous, as pertaining to justice, and that it is right for us to desire to express love and admiration for whether it's the borders of your homeland or the values that are embodied within it. We say that that's a virtuous thing. I think we have to be careful to just outrightly dismiss Every single cultural or spiritual expression, I'll say specifically here in Canada, of our Indigenous peoples, as now being pagan or at best worthless because they've received the Catholic faith. Catholicism doesn't replace every single facet of human life. It enhances every facet of human life. And so I, I think we, we should not be so quick to just assume that something needs to be 
cast aside because it's somehow been replaced by your Catholic faith. The Catholicism does not replace uh, anything but sin. So show me the sin. What, what's, where's the sin? Where's the evil in this? And if you can't, it's because you don't know what you're talking about. So it's not helpful in the comments section of anything. I think we touched a button now, one way. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. You got me <laughs> all riled up here, Jenny. Don't, don't apologize. I agree I with appreciate. everything you just said. Yeah. Um, I just want to, with this comment, bring it home to the reality within any particular parish. I think everything that we've been saying highlights the need for the priest to sit down with his people and say, okay, if this is part of your culture, what does it mean to you? Help me understand what that is. And then on, on the priest's part, here's what we mean uh, by doing this, that, or saying this or that within the liturgy. Here's what it means. Now, in what way can they come together? In what way ought they not to come together? And let's come to a, a consensus around that it is, that is deeply respectful. Now, if we look back to play the devil's advocate, to, if we look back in the history of, of the Catholic Church and its its founding in a, in a context where Ro, the the culture of the Roman Empire would have been there, there was there was a paganism to it. So you see uh, a tradition like burning incense, where uh, it was burned to the emperor, it was burned to pagan gods, right? So you have this tradition of burning incense, which we use within the mass, within Catholicism, and we, that incense is burned to the one and only true God, right? So it seems, at least within that context, that something like burning incense, it's basically as good as the intentions of the person that's burning the incense. And would you say that that's true in the case of smudging? Is that essentially what I'm hearing? That it's it's basically, it's it's a neutral action in and of itself. It depends on what the intention of the person is. Well, we, I always want to be careful to not turn us into utilitarians that neutralize the object of the act. Like we can't just ignore the act of what we are performing. There are some things that would pertain to the realm of intrinsic evil. And so your intentions can't always just justify anything. That's uh, just a moral principle. But at the same time, what you're describing, Jenny, is is part of what has to go into addressing a question like this, because if you don't understand what the person understands themselves to be doing, you, you can't just outrightly condemn it. But nor can we just automatically condone it, because if a person has a, a, a mistaken or a bad intention in what otherwise seems to be an innocuous or neutral thing, then that also needs to be clarified uh, and addressed with that with that individual. So that's why Archbishop Smith's point is so important about conversation, seeking to understand each other. What does this mean to you? Why do you do this? Why would it be significant? Uh, so that it can open up the doors to, to deeper understanding. That's That should always be uh, the fundamental principle, that we are seeking to understand each other. And that only comes through discourse and dialogue. And so that's why those conversations need to be happening uh, before uh, some kind of decision or, or proclamation would be made. And I would add, too, that in our individualistic culture, we have to be careful not to approach these things individualistically. So when it comes to the use of incense within the church, it reflects the mind of the church as to what is happening in that particular moment. And I would think when we look at the act of smudging within any particular First Nation, it would reflect the mind and the tradition of the people, not just of an individual. So it's really not appropriate, I don't think in either case, for an individual to come forward and say, I say it means this, therefore. No, no, no. You're entering into and you're acting, you're acting as one who needs to be in communion with the mind of the church within the liturgy and should be also reflective of the tradition and the thinking of your own people of whom you are a part. Now, if you walk, again, if we walk all the way back to 2,000 years ago, Jesus is, is walking earth, and he's interacting, for instance, with Greek culture. There's a lot of paganism within that tradition. And a lot of culturally, of course, for instance, Greek culture has impacted how the Catholic Church has developed, at least culturally, right? And of course, Greek philosophers have, have a huge impact in, in our Catholic legacy. Now, a parallel example would be, like you pointed out, Father Cristino, indigenous is such a broad word, right? There's so many different First Nations, traditionally so many different tribes, um, so many different cultures within quote-unquote indigenous culture. 
And so there's certainly, my understanding is, is that there are authentically pagan indigenous cultures, just as there are indigenous Catholics, just as we, when we would look back at Western European history, there, it's a mishmash of Jewish and Christian, and there were Greek Christians, but there were also Greeks who were genuinely pagans, who were worshiping evil gods and doing evil things. So when we're approaching, and uh, yeah, especially in your case, where you've, you're seeing this marriage within yourself of indigenous heritage and Catholicism, how, how does one, especially an outsider, wrestle with the fact that there, 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 there is authentic paganism within both of these cultures that I'm, that I'm talking about, right? It's, it's not as though all indigenous culture isn't paganism and et cetera, right? Well, I, first of all, we speak, we use the word pagan almost as some kind of pejorative. Uh, okay. And we say it with some disdain, like, oh, this is so pagan. It has a, a historic Greek understanding. I mean, I haven't studied the etymology right. to speak off, off the top of my head about it right now. But my point is that we use it as, uh, it's sort of like the word that we use now, heretic. Oh, oh, they're a heretic. I don't listen to him. He's a heretic. Why is he a heretic? Well, he wrote a book uh, that uh, was condemned by Cardinal Ratzinger. So he's a heretic. Well, is he a heretic or did he say a bad thing or a mistaken thing in one chapter of a book and the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith asked him to clarify himself? You know, like we just throw words out. And I don't think we even always know what we mean by them. I think pagan is one of those words that we say, oh, you participate in false or evil uh, worship. So you're a pagan or that is pagan. I'm, all I'm asking us to do is step back from just hurling out these categories and first understand what we mean by them and then appreciate that it is part of being human to have the instinct and inclination towards worshiping that that is a good thing, and that if it is misdirected in light of the gospel, then that needs to be understood through dialogue and proper communication. Uh, and so this, it's a lot more work than just observing something, watching a YouTube video, and then typing pagan into the comment box. There, ha there has to be a depth of understanding as to what is going on. And I, I'll jump to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and my family heritage. My nonna, my Italian grandmother, yeah. one time after supper, we had the same ritual. You fold up the tablecloth, you go outside to the back porch and you shake it out so that you don't let all the crumbs go on the floor. And so I was doing as I always had done. And then she yelled at me, what are you doing? Come back. And apparently, you don't, you don't shake out the tablecloth after dark in November it's disrespectful to the souls in purgatory. So, I, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Well, no, just you shake it over the floor and sweep it up. Okay, now, where did my grandmother receive that teaching? Now, is she a pagan? Is, is, that, is that some kind of superstition? I, I have no idea where that came from, but it sure sounds like it's somehow influenced by Catholicism, uh, dishonoring the souls in purgatory. We have tons of these things in Western European expressions of Catholicism. They're not acts of worship. They're not even acts of religion. In many cases, they're probably misunderstandings of something rooted in superstition. But they have to be understood. And then we have to evaluate. Because my grandmother is probably mistaken about something, do I have an obligation to still shake out the tablecloth after dark in November so that I don't participate in her misunderstanding? Is there any harm in me saying, okay, in November after dark, I shake out the tablecloth in the kitchen and then I sweep up the crumbs? Uh, we have to be open to understanding where some of these things come from, even if they are, are kind of crazy. Do you have any... One of the, the key words that has been coming up throughout this, um, spoken and unspoken, let's say, First is spoke, the spoken one is dialogue, and then beneath it all is the need for encounter. Where do we find opportunities really to sit down, encounter, listen to one another, understand one another's uh, backgrounds and where we're coming from, and then on the basis of good, honest, mutual relationship, mutually trustworthy, we're able to open up and have these conversations. Because apart from that, we're just, as Father Cristino and yourself are saying, we're kind of throwing terms around which... When that happens within the social media 
mess can lead not to reconciliation and mutual support and healing, but to the furtherance of the polarization. So what to me this conversation is, is just calling us again and again and again to make the effort to meet the other, know the other, understand the background. Um, but in that context, not be afraid to speak the truth of the gospel because as a Christian people, we understand it's truth. It is truth. Jesus is the truth. Um, and it is it is life-giving and life-transforming. And we as Christians are charged with carrying that and handing it on and, and speaking uh, as the opportunities are granted to us. And I think to, to go back to your Greek history that you've been alluding to, the, the primary example from that for me for that of that for me is St. Paul in the Areopagus. Right? He went to the Areopagus, that that place of debate, of discussion, in a context of the worship of multiple gods, including, in order to I think it was kind of hedging all their bets, uh, worship of an unknown god, and he saw this monument. And he said, you know, you're you're worshiping an unknown god. Let me tell you who God is announcing the gospel respectfully in that, and truthfully, in that particularly religious context. So taking that as an example, how do we, in the context in which we're living now, and our, our immediate context is the question of our relationship with the indigenous peoples, and we've come so, so far under the guidance of the Holy Father recently in furthering those relationships and opening up doors and avenues of, of conversation. How do we carry on, right? And will there be those moments, and we pray that grace will give them, where we are able to sit down and say, okay, what is your cultural tradition? What is your spiritual tradition? Help me to understand that. And now let me help, let me tell you what ours. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the gospel. How, how do they come together? I, I pray for those opportunities, and I, and I would welcome them. And I think we need to keep all of these different discussions as important as we are. Let's just keep making them concrete in the lives of real people. Now, we're, we're nearing the close of our time, but speaking of the concrete, one of the most concrete parts of the Mass, as I, as I understand it, is are the rubrics of the Mass. Uh, Archbishop, can you explain what that means if someone hears the term, well, let's follow the rubrics of the, the Mass? Rubrics are what the little that? instructions in red. What's the Latin word, uh, Father Cristino, that we get rubric from? So if you look at the Missal, all right, okay. the, the words that are spoken orally are all in black, the instructions given to the priest as he goes through the through the missal are all in red. Okay. So it refers to the instructions of the mass, how mass is to be celebrated, and they're written in red. And it comes from the, I'm forgetting the Latin root there, but that that mm -hmm. we get that word rubric from that. Okay. Okay. And and Father Cristino, for instance, when you're in a context where you're coordinating a liturgy, um, I mean the papal visit would be a good example. What's the relationship between those red instructions, the rubrics of the Mass? Are they, and actually well, both of you, are they supposed to be followed to the T? Is there what, how much room is there in a sense uh, to add something for the sake of a cultural context or to eliminate something in the red? What, yeah, how, how seriously is a priest supposed to take those rubrics in terms of culture and the celebration of the Mass? I would say, first of all, yeah. um, very seriously. Right. One of the things we every priest has to guard against is a form of clericalism whereby he can take the liturgy, which is that of the church, and expresses the faith of the church. That's how serious this is. Right? And on his own decide, no, I think I can shift this, change these words, or do these things. Um, at the same time, depending on what part of the Mass we find ourselves, there can be uh, options there for... Uh, giving some cultural expression, whether it's in the music or whether it's in introductory words or the way the Mass is, is introduced. Very often the rubrics will say, the, the priest will now say these or similar words of introduction. So there, there, can, there can be space, obviously, for some uh, accommodation. Father Cristino? Yeah, I, I think that I really appreciated uh, His Grace's comment about the respect for ceremony that we have received, I think we inherit that from our Indigenous people, uh, that there is a proper way of doing something if you're going to participate in uh, a ceremony. I was recently at a gathering where uh, we were uh, praying together uh, around fire and the uh, participation in that was requested that everybody returned back to their place by walking eastward. 
as a recognition of following the path of the sun uh, that goes around uh, the, the, the sky. Why not just do that if that's what's asked to, if, that, if that's a respectful way of participating in a ceremony that you are a part of? By extension, when the priest celebrates the Mass, uh, he is the celebrant of the Mass. I mean, we t we've taken to using the word presider, uh, which has the idea of kind of like where we get president from. And that almost gives the impression that you've got some kind of authority to decide what's going on here, but you don't. That authority is not given to you by virtue of that. It is the honor to have been invited to participate in the church's worship. And it has been entrusted to you to guide and direct that worship as a priest. And so we must do so uh, with fidelity uh, to the rubrics, of, of course. But that's the, that's the lowest common denominator. Uh, we should not only be asking, what do I have to do? And then just limit ourselves to that. She must, what, what can I do to uh, celebrate with the dignity and respect uh, and, and the honor that should be afforded to the liturgy in, in a manner that is going to, as we were talking about at the beginning, facilitate that encounter with the transcendent, where we will more powerfully experience communion with the Blessed Trinity, uh, which is what all of our worship is supposed to be for. Well, Father Cristino, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you again, Father Cristino. Welcome yeah. back. We had you on this before, before, before yes. we went to YouTube. That's right. Now yes, everybody sees I, what you look like. <laughs> now, I guess, there's no hiding. There'll be lots of comments, Jenny. Get ready. Yeah, that's right. We'll have, we'll have another episode just to talk about the crazy chaos of the YouTube comments section. <laughs> or I'll just never be invited back on, and then we'll know never where again. the comments went. <laughs> You're always welcome. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and God bless you. It's always good you. to be with you all. Yeah. God bless you. So thanks everybody for watching. Hope you found it helpful along your, your journey of faith. Please know that I'm praying for you. And if you would, be so kind as to pray for us also. Every blessing to you. God bless. God bless.